Hi, welcome back to Electronic Structure and Bonding in Inorganic Chemistry. My name is Kevin Tokoff. Make sure to like this video and subscribe for future videos and notifications. All right, so in this video and the next few, we're going to go over specific examples of how you calculate crystal field stabilization energy. Um, ultimately, I am going to break this up in each example into two videos, so this will be part one. All right, the complex we're going to be looking at here is hexa aqua iron three. Okay, so in each of these videos, we're also gonna go over the major steps that you're gonna need um, in order to figure out the crystal field stabilization energy, all right? These can be long problems, but once you do a few of them, um, they start to make a little bit of sense. All right, and by the way, this flow chart right here, I wanna give credit where credit is due. This was created by Dr. Jason Smee of the University of Texas at Tyler. I did not create this, but it turns out that it's a very, very helpful flow chart to doing these problems. All right, so the first thing we need to do is figure out the charge on iron. Okay, so the way I like to do this is you look at the charge of the overall complex, which is, is positive three, and the overall charge of the complex has to equal the sum of the individual charges. So the charge of water is zero, and if there were a charge, it would matter, but, and then we multiply by the number of water. So zero times six, and then you have to add on the charge from iron. Well, clearly you can see this is zero, so we can see that this is actually iron three. So iron is gonna have a plus three charge. So we can write that as iron three plus. Now, the, that's the first step in all of this. We need to figure out what iron's charge is. The second step is we need to calculate the number of d orbital electrons. So for that, we remember that it's three plus, we need to go to a periodic table, okay? Luckily, we can fit all this in here. So this is iron's atom right here if it were neutral. It would fill up all these electrons, the 4s2, and then 3d, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. That's if iron was completely neutral and unionized, okay? Now, one thing to keep in mind, to remember, that whenever iron, or in general, most of these atoms give up electrons, they give up preferentially the s orbital ones first. So we'd lose this one from calcium and then this potassium, and then we have to lose another one. Why? Because it's three plus, meaning we lost three electrons. So we lose this one, this one, and this one. So that means now we have the, essentially we have a D5, okay? So remember, we have, if neutral would be D6, but then we're gonna lose two here and then lose another one. So that means we have one, two, three, four, five D electrons, okay? So our number of D electrons is five, all right? So we go to this flow chart now. Does the ion, in this case iron, have four to seven D electrons? Yes. Generally for the ones they're gonna give you on the test, the answer will always be yes. The reason no is not really the answer is because nothing really interesting happens, okay? So we're not really concerned with that. Um, but yes is the answer to this because five falls between four and seven. All right, so then we need to ask, is iron a first row transition metal? Well, yeah, it is. It's in the first row of transition metals. So the answer to that is yes. So yes. Now, the ligands, are they strong field ligands? All right, for this question right here, there's really three main ones you should be aware of, okay? The first one is triphenylphosphine. This is triphenylphosphine. The second one is cyanide, and the last one is carbon monoxide, or what you refer to them as carbonyls, as ligands. If it's any of these three, then the answer is gonna be yes, because these are your main three strong field ligands that we're gonna see. Now, here the ligands are water, so the answer to this question, strong field ligands, is no. If the ligands were, say, carbonyls, then the answer would be yes, and it would automatically be low spin. So the answer is no, because the ligands are water, so we go to, is this a high oxidation state? And by high oxidation state, we mean the charge on the, on the iron is greater than or equal to four. Well, no, the charge is three plus. So it's not greater than or equal to four, so no. So we're gonna choose this as being high spin. Okay, this is high spin, all right? And the exception is cobalt three plus. Well, this is not cobalt three plus, so our, our determination is this is high spin. 
The next thing we want to do is set up our crystal field diagram. All right. So we're going to have these orbitals down here are going to be your T2G, and the two up here are going to be E sub G. Okay. And just remember the total distance or difference in energy, and let me actually do this instead. The total difference in energy between these uh, two energies is your delta octahedral. Okay, that is your delta octahedral. Now what I'm going to show is the degenerate energy level. This is the degenerate energy level, okay? And just keep in mind the distance in energy between E sub G and the degenerate. This one is three-fifths delta octahedral. The difference in energy between degenerate and T2G, this is two-fifths delta octahedral. Okay, that's just something to keep in mind. All right, so we know it's high spin, so what does high spin mean? High spin means it's low field. So there's low electrostatic field, so there's not as much repulsion between these, which means these EG and T2G orbitals are close together in energy. Okay, there's not as much splitting. So the way I like to think about it is if it's high spin, you can go up high initially and fill in electrons. Okay, so we have high spin and we have 5D electrons. So we're going to go one, there's the first electron, here's the second electron, the third. If this were low spin, we would have to go fill in the electrons in the T2G. But since it's high spin, we can come up here high, we can go up high and fill in the fourth and fifth right there. Okay, now one key I want you to remember with high spin, pairing energy. Okay, we'll get to that when we do a low spin example and we designate pairing energy by the symbol P. We're not going to use any pairing energy when we do high spin. When we do low spin, we will, and we'll explain what pairing energy is. Okay, in any case, we wouldn't even have to worry about it here, anyways, because there's no electrons paired up. But suffice it to say, high spin, you're never going to use pairing energy. If that confused you, don't worry about it, but we'll, we'll figure out what that means. All right, so what we're going to need to do is calculate the crystal field stabilization energy. How do you calculate crystal field stabilization energy? Well, first we're going to deal with the energy associated with T2G, and then we're going to subtract off that associated with the E sub G. All right, so T2G. Well, the energy is going to be two-fifths delta octahedral times the number of electrons in the T2G, which is three, minus, up here for E sub G, three-fifths delta octahedral times the number of electrons in the EG orbitals, and that's two. And so this is ultimately going to become six-fifths delta octahedral minus, again, six-fifths delta octahedral. So in this case, the crystal field stabilization energy is zero. All right, so that is an example of starting just with some coordination complex and then going all the way down to calculating the crystal field stabilization energy. All right, in the next video we're going to do another example of this. Join us then. Hope you like this video. Make sure to like it and subscribe to the channel for future videos and notifications. Thank you.